This is the Dick, Cliff, and Gene show. <laughs> okay. We've got two middle-aged guys and one elder here. Uh, I'm the near to, elder. To reminisce <laughs> about how they all came to be involved in emergency medicine. So what do you want the world to know about? Why did you do it? How did it all start? Well, what made you think about it? All right, when I came to uh, medicine, it was by a circuitous route. Uh, World War II, four years, 42 to 46. Uh, engineering, electrical engineering at Cornell. And my junior year, uh, I thought first about medicine. And I talked to the dean of the electrical engineering school and the dean said, I've had one other electrical engineer go into medicine. He's down at the Cornell Med Center. And uh, why don't you go down and talk to him? And he had graduated in 1928. <laughs> <laughs> so I went down there and I met the guy, Bill Gahegan. He was a professor at the Cornell Med, Med Center. And Bill said, very nice guy. He said, you've only got a few months and you'll have your degree. Go ahead and get your degree and work for a year and see how it goes. I thought that was good sense. Uh, so I got my degree and it was February of 1949. And there was a big slump post-war in 49. I walked the streets for six weeks, filling out applications, trying to get a job. I finally got a job with the Staten Island Edison Company on Staten Island, which me, uh, a kid from Missouri, southwest Missouri. Where are you from? I was from Clinton, Missouri, population 5,000. You were from Wichita, it's a big city. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you grew up? Well, up and down the East Coast, Norfolk, Virginia, mainly in Florida, from Lauderdale. Okay. Was your dad military? He was Navy man. How did I know that? My dad was in the Army in World War II. Yeah, but uh, you moved around. You moved around. So you know military that. people move yeah, around. Yeah, move around, right? Yeah. That's right. So anyway, so I got my my job with the Edison Company, uh, and I worked as an electrical engineer for six years. Uh, now I'm 30 years old, and in 1954, uh, I was 30, and. You did not get in medical school very easily as an older mm -hmm. applicant. Right. And I decided it's now or never, I'll try it. And uh, so I went to, I told my boss that I wanted to go to medical school. And it was on a Sunday, I had asked to see him and he knew it was something pretty dire that I would bother him on a Sunday morning. And so I really liked the guy, and he really was good to me. And I told him my story. And he said, let me ask you one question. I thought, oh, man, here it comes. He said, what can I do to help you out? Wow. I nearly fell out of my chair. So I went to summer school. I went to NYU downtown. I remember my organic chemistry class, which I had to take, had about a couple of hundred students, and they were all pre-med. And they all needed A's. That's right. Mm -hmm. And quite a curve. I had never met competition like New York City in little old Clinton, Missouri. <laughs> but, and 
I got turned down. I put in 13 applications, and I got turned down several without an interview. And I interviewed in Syracuse, University of New York at Syracuse. And there were about six of us, five young guys, and me. There weren't many girls at that time. Almost none were there. Almost none. And so a secretary came out and gave us each a yellow pad and a pencil and said, write in 300 words or less why you want to go to medical school. And the five young guys said, this is juvenile. This is ridiculous. We've already filled out our application. Not Gene Nagel. Mm -hmm. I was writing my heart out mm -hmm. on that yellow pad. Now, do you think your life experiences of having done something before you went to medical school enabled you to do that better? Because you made it Desperation decision. made me do better. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted in. And uh, I got interviewed by an old. Now, what does the word old mean to you? 89 to 100. Ah. At that point, it means about 40. <laughs> it means... It means 10 years older than Ten you are. Older. That's old. That's, right. That's old. That's right. And he was old. He was about 60s. And nice guy. And I went home to New York City. And a few weeks later, I get a letter. It's another rejection, I think. You have been accepted to the medical class in 1955. Yes. at Syracuse and I, I tell very often I'll tell people that it was the happiest moment of my life which of course doesn't make my wife happy <laughs> <laughs> at any rate she's used to me and uh, I went down to Washington University St. Louis and I wanted to go there and I can't really tell you why, but it was a good medical school. Syracuse is a good medical yes. school. And so it's May of 45, of uh, 50, uh, 55. And I am being interviewed by a six foot, two or three inch surgeon, arrogant. But then I'm repeating myself. Uh, By the time named Barb Miller, full professor of surgery, and a little pediatrician with a little bow tie and white buck shoes. <laughs> and the registrar is an older guy sitting there. He's also an MD. And the little pediatrician starts out with a question that I didn't really fully understand. And uh, I'm trying to make sense of it and say something. And Barb Miller leans over and he goes on the table. Inkwell flies in the air. Uh, little pediatrician almost gets incontinent. And, <laughs> and Barb Miller said, were you in the military? And this is 1955. Yeah. I said, yes, sir. He said, I don't suppose you got to Korea. That's the first time I heard the fife and drum. Mm -hmm. I said, I wasn't in that war. Well, it kind of startled me. Mm -hmm. I got into Washington U. Mm -hmm. that's great. Now, that's in, in May of 55. Fast forward, it's now October in St. Louis. October in St. Louis, it's a rainy weekend. When it rains in Missouri, it rains for three days. And so it's a gloomy seven o'clock, foggy, rainy, and I'm crossing the street uh, from eating at the hospital to coming back to study. As I'm crossing the foggy street, this big hulk passes me, and he turns around. He said, hey, 
I turn around, it's Dr. Bart Miller, the six foot two inch surgeon. He comes near me like I'm a bug. Mm -hmm. He says, you're that older one, aren't you? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. He said, well, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm not setting the world on fire, but I'm in the middle somewhere. He turned and walked off. And over his shoulder, he said, hell, I didn't think you'd win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it is 1962. I go to Miami. I'm working uh, in Jackson Memorial Hospital. <clears throat> I get married, number one. We're living in a little uh, one-bedroom condo unit, and uh, my wife's an ex-nurse. Uh, she got pregnant right away, and there's a cardiac arrest in the building. And somebody else, doctor, and I go out, and I go down a few floors. We're on the 11th floor. Somewhere below me, guys, overweight, uh, middle-aged guy. And I start mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. Another doctor comes up. Uh, he does mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. I do close chest. Uh, CPR only started in 1960. So this is 63, uh, and the fire squad comes, three guys in the Miami Fire Department. And the lieutenant is a Lieutenant Ken McCullough, 6'2", 210, what I always wanted to be. You too, probably. <laughs> sure. Skinny we, little guy. You wanted to play football. Yeah, all right. And uh, I said, it's no use, uh, and he had vomited, he had aspirated, there was no pulse, and so forth. And so Ken said, McCullough, the lieutenant, said, no matter what we do, they all die. Well, in the hospital, occasionally, we would resuscitate somebody. And back in those days, you the, the drugs were calcium chloride, or carbonate, uh, epinephrine, uh, bicarbonate, and defibrillate. And the defibrillation in 63, 4, 5, uh, physio control, DC defibrillators were not common yet. Uh, I think physio started around 65, 66. There were some other manufacturers, Men in Great Brock, uh, Corbin Farnsworth, Mine Safety. There were some other DC defibrillator. Anyway, so I said to the lieutenant, uh, can I come down to the fire station like on Saturday when I'm off? Sure. So I went down there on Saturday. These guys did not need for me to teach them CPR. They knew. And we talked, and I thought, they're bright, uh, they're motivated, and they're the only people on the outside. Uh, if you stop a doctor on the street, he may be a psychiatrist or a dermatologist. Well, they you place know. the doctors in the emergency, <laughs> yeah. room, such as they were in the emergency room. Oh, there was, the ER docs hadn't started. There weren't any ER docs. It was called the Pontiac Plan. Let me, let me digress a minute. No plan. Uh, when you're 89 years old, you better jump on a thought while you have it, because it'll be gone if you don't. Uh, the ER, that was the nicest term for it, because it often was called the pit, and the doctors that staffed the ER uh, were on rotation, and they hated it, and they, kicking and screaming, they came into the ER.
right. for their night. Part of the medical it, staff obligation. Yeah, to take and they only they're only there once mm -hmm. every two months, but still, they would bitch and moan about it. So, uh, I thought primarily of cardiac arrest in those early days. I wasn't thinking particularly of trauma or other modalities. And I thought there's only a couple of drugs that we commonly use. We defibrillate. And uh, these guys, they can probably do it. And uh, so we started to talk of that. And the fire chief was very proud of the fact that Miami had a, a number one rating by the insurance industry as a fire department. Now, the number one rating means that you've got fire hydrants wherever they're supposed to be. You've got fire stations scattered around. Right. You've got a response time of so much. I don't know everything to know about ratings. But it means you've got the lowest insurance cost, fire insurance cost, that you can have. Right. He's very proud of that. And he didn't want anything <laughs> to affect that. And they only had the one rescue truck. And he was very wary of me. I'm, I'm a do-gooder. And you know what do-gooders often do. A scary guy. Oh, they often muck up the situation. <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they might think they're doing good, but they're not. But anyway. But over, okay. over the years, uh, with the Miami Fire Department, uh, we were looking primarily at cardiac arrest. And it didn't occur to us at that early time about EMS, generalized sure. emergency care. Did it exist? And some milestones along the way. In 1966, the government formed the National Highway Safety and Transportation Agency. They had 13 standards. Ding, 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 ding. I can't name an order, but number one is seat belts. Uh, don't hold me to these. But number two, crash barrier. If the highway, if there's an off ramp, there's some crash barriers there in case you do something wrong. Uh, there is automobile construction, crash safety. Uh, they would crash cars into concrete barriers at 15 miles an hour and uh, whatever. So there are 13 of them. Number 11 is EMS. And Although the other branches had hundreds of employees, EMS had three. It had a retired Marine Corps colonel, uh, the head of it. Uh, Joe Stephanie was his secretary aide guy. And they decided, we'll put a helicopter guy in because uh, Coast Guard helicopters can carry emergency cases, okay? So they, they put Joe Stephanie, not Joe Stephanie, Captain John Waters into that position. He promptly retired in disgust from the Coast Guard. I'm not going to be with that Mickey Mouse outfit there in highway safety. Well, and he became Duval County's yes. public administrator right. and one of the early EMS right. things. Okay. Right. Anyway, and uh, the colonel, the Marine Corps colonel, the head of it, uh, he hated 
another EMS figure so bad, uh, Peter Sanford. Wow. He hated him so bad. Why? Well, Saffer, did you know Saffer? I didn't know, but his yeah. books, he said that. I mean, he's the Saffer. the guru of CPR. Oh, he is. The guru of survivability. And the oh, things yeah. he did on, on dogs, it's, it's still 50, 60 years later, we're still going back and learning. There's Germany, okay? They're ordinary people. There's Austrians. They speak German. But they're, they're higher. Aristocratic. <laughs> and, and Saffer was way up there among the Austrians. Okay? He was a close friend of mine. He was arrogant. Okay? I still have his book. His, his yeah. first book he wrote. It's kind of, yeah. it's still a Bible. I know. And the Marine Corps colonel, uh, he tolerated arrogance poorly. Okay. Being a Marine Corps colonel. Okay. And I was the second guy to come in front of him, and he thought I was less arrogant, and I got some early funds from Highway Safety, my first significant grant, really. And I bought a defibrillator from a new company, uh, Physio Control. And we shook it to pieces in two weeks' time. And I sent it back to Seattle in a body bag. And I got a new one that was properly put together, meaning all of the screws and washers were glyptolled. It's a plastic. Uh, and all of the sensitive things were shock-mounted. And it was a good defibrillator. And uh, so... Uh, now we had a defibrillator. I needed to, the fire chief was okay with defibrillation. CPR. This was an AC or DC defibrillator? These were DC. Okay. There were four DCs at that time. But Corbin Farnsworth was Mickey Mouse. It was dry cell batteries. Men and Great Bach, too heavy. Mine safety way too heavy, 50 pounds. Uh, so carbon, the physio was the best unit. Uh, now I want to start IVs. And the fire chief with great guy. Oh, the fire chiefs at Miami, by and large, deserve to be at their, at their level. Because they but, were visionaries? Because they allowed the change to take place? The chief did not want any uh, blot on his career. So as long as I did not create something in the newspaper that it went embarrassing, he was cool. But God help me in those early days if I had right. come a cropper, okay? <laughs> so... Uh, I wanted IVs, and he said, you'll have to go in front of the Miami City Commission. So we go down to Dinner Key, and there are five commissioners, and the five commissioners in the building sit up on a dais. Big table, beautiful, ornate table. They all have big chairs, bigger than this. And Big, high back leather, expenses, no problem if you're a commissioner. And then we're down here on the lower level, peons, okay? They still do that. And so I said uh, to the five commissioners, we need to have IVs. I said, if a doctor were to come along on the street, it could be a dermatologist, it could be a psychiatrist, it could be a veterinary medicine, who knows. And may or may not be skilled at what we need. I want these six officers who've been trained uh, to be allowed to use their training. 
and I said, I will be the cardiac arrest. And I climbed up on the table and laid down. And I said, I have now suffered a cardiac arrest. And Lieutenant Ken McCullough, uh, the big guy that I'd met in the building, is called and he's going to start an IV. Well, you know Chelco's, you know Intercast. We didn't have those. Right. He had an 18 gauge steel needle. Uh -huh. Bingo in the vein. Who faded? And it's <laughs> and it's dripping. And I said, I would rather have a trained individual like this fire lieutenant than just any passerby. And they said it's okay. So now we had IVs. The fire chief didn't give a damn what you stuck in the IV. It could be Santa flush. It could be cyanide or whatever. But did you Once the you IV is there, what you stick in the rubber cap, who right, cares? Right, right, yeah, okay. Right. So now we had medication. Okay. And things are going along. And what medications did you use? The three. Calcium, uh, epi, and bicarb. bicarb. Okay. Now we get to uh, innovation. And he told me, no. And so that's when Harry Heinich and I sprayed each other with 5% cocaine. <laughs> and six officers innovated me. Six officers innovated Harry. And, well, I innovated Harry first. And he innovated me first. And so then the next morning at 9 o'clock, I go to Dinner Key, not to Dinner Key, but to the fire chief station on uh, number one, fire station number one. And I see Larry Kenny. And I said, Chief, this is what we did. God damn it, Nagel, he said. <laughs> I told you no innovations. I said, Chief, they all did it perfect. All right. They will be allowed to innovate and try one time. And if they don't get the tube in, bag and mask into the hospital. I said, fair enough. Mm -hmm. And that's how we started. That's great. Okay. What year was that? 1969. 69, yeah. Okay. So in 69, Seattle started, uh, Los Angeles, Columbus, St. Vincent's, with mobile coronary care and riding a doctor, like Pantridge did in Ireland. Miami, we started <clears throat> with no doctor and telemetry. So they would send us an EKG and we could talk to the firemen on the scene. Tell a little bit about the telemetry. Were you working with Jim Hirschman at that point, or you did it? Jim and I were together. Right. From about 66 or 7, right on. So you were already working on the telemetry? Yeah. Piece. And how did and, you do that? Okay. First, we con I contacted uh, RCA, Zenith, uh, Motorola, because we had a space program going on. Telemetry was not new. Right. Uh, the space program used to, anybody that went up had EKGs coming back and voice coming back. Mm -hmm. And those companies couldn't have been less interested. Space was big money. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted, it didn't look like any business at all. And a little company Biocom was in California and they made a little modulator so that a person at home could send an EKG by telephone to their doctor if he had a demodulator and could write it out. And so Biocom said, well, we can make that. And they sent me a couple of units. Didn't work worth a hoot because the radio, it wasn't telephone. The radio completely blanked out the unit with radio RF. Okay. And so they went back to the drawing board 
built a unit that would work shielded. and block out, shielded, block out the radio. And that's what we that's what we used. And so we had uh, good voice communication, good EKGs, but we needed a direct line uh, from the scene over the fire department radio to Jackson Memorial Hospital. And what I needed was a telephone line from the fire department communication headquarters to Jackson Hospital, mm -hmm. a dedicated, dedicated line. line to the uh, recovery room right, I remember. module. Okay. Right. And so I told the phone company, they said, you're going to have to work. You're going to have to wait because we're behind in installing. And it's a three-month wait. Uh, that was the Miami office, Southern Bell. Southern Bell was in Florida, Alabama, and Georgia, as I remember one other state. Anyway, so I look up Southern Bell, and their headquarters is in Birmingham, I think, or Alabama somewhere. So I dial the number. See, when you grow up in a small town, you're not afraid of big, big cities and bureaucracy. I dial it, and by God, uh, a guy answers on the second ring. And I said, I'm calling from Miami. I'm a Dr. Gene Nagel. He said, I'm, I've forgotten his name. I'm vice president of Southern Bell, Joe Montgomery. I said, Joe, I'm happy to meet you. And I told him what it was that we needed. This was like on a Monday or a Tuesday. He said, I'll be in Miami on Thursday. How about you have lunch with me at the Everglades Hotel? It's the top of the yeah. hotel. And I said, great. So on Thursday, he and I are on the, we meet at 1130 or something like that. And he said, now, the local executives will be coming in here. And he said, we won't tell them what we're doing. I said, okay. So three guys come in, tie suits, looking important, and they see Montgomery. And they all come over and they kiss his ring. He's the vice president uh, from the big headquarters. And they look at me as if, who are you? And Joe doesn't tell him. He introduced me, but he didn't tell him. And he said, after we have lunch, he said, I think you'll get some action this afternoon. And this afternoon, I got a call that afternoon. And they said, where do you want the line? <laughs> and we were in business, okay? So, now, the head of Jackson Memorial Hospital was a Dr. Kermit Gates. Uh, he died during the buildup of this. But the next guy, Bill Nordwall, could not have been nicer to me. And he, the telephone line and the, <clears throat> the central in the recovery room, whatever. He said, it's fine with us. So I had fairly smooth uh, beginnings. Now let me tell you the worst hour in Miami. Uh, we're swimming along. The media, the Miami News, the Miami Herald, uh, the radio stations, Channel 4, TV. Boy, we had press every week. It was wonderful. And the public, the, the uh, Florida Heart Association, uh, we could not have been given more support. Because they wanted to see the idea work or it was working? It was working. And it, was a, it just was the right time for the public. Uh, the space technology the public, brought home. Yeah, the public uh, was tired of Vietnam. We had the riots in Miami in 69. 
uh, this is now 70, 71, it was swimming. And it's 9 o'clock in the morning, and Chief Kenny gets me on the phone and he said, did you read this morning's paper? I said, no, sir. He said, I will be over at Jackson Hospital in 15 minutes. He brings the papers. There is a columnist, whether it was the news or the, I think it might have been the Miami News, because Bill Roberts had a column, I think, on the local section of the Miami News. And that morning, it said, the Miami Rescue Squad attended a serious medical incident at Joe Smith's home. Where, what? And in spite of a doctor being on the scene, they took poor Miss Jones to the hospital, or Mr. Jones to the hospital, wouldn't allow his wife to ride along. Uh, his billfold got stolen. He all probably stolen. And he died. And isn't this awful? Now, Bill Roberts uh, was a, looked like a middle linebacker, <laughs> linebacker for the Dolphins. Crew cut, tough looking guy. And I've got three lieutenants at that time. And Tommy, I've forgotten his last name, Tommy was not that well educated and did not speak like a gifted orator. But Chief Kenny said, if I had a problem, I'd rather have Tommy on the scene than anybody. Cool under fire. And Tommy comes <clears> in <throat> and the chief come in the office. And the chief said, what happened? Tommy said, well, we attended the cardiac arrest and the guy uh, had no activity. And we started CPR, started an IV, he didn't always get an IV going on somebody who was in arrest. That's right. Had an IV, uh, gave some drugs, had some, art, had some act, ventricular fib activity, defibrillated, had a pulse, and the wife came in, uh, and an elderly doctor with Parkinsonism and wanted to know what's going on. <laughs> and we were worried about him falling down and having a fractured hip or something. And uh, we offered to let him ride in the ambulance with us to the hospital, uh, but he refused. We got to the hospital and we had, like usual, all of the effects we had in a bag which we gave to the ER and uh, he didn't make it and not all of them made it and uh, that's it. I said, Tommy, let you and I go talk to Bill Roberts. So we went down to the newspaper and we laid it out and the next day in Bill Roberts' column, well I talked to the lieutenant, so-and-so, and the -so, Dr. Nagel, and this is what happened. Da -da -da. And if I had a cardiac arrest in Miami, I hope that that same squad takes care of me. <laughs> that's, that's awful nice of him. Yeah. And that was really... Yeah. And that was the darkest moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else? Interesting. That's great. You know, we all had a lot of history with EMS, and as we get older, we think that, that the, the younger people aren't doing anything different. <coughs> what, do, you have any, do you have any idea of, of what you think the next big issues might be for people to face, for people to try and solve? 
Well, let me, you two are both emergency medicine physicians, okay? And that specialty came along uh, because it needed to come along, okay? But also, your pioneers was a doctor in Kansas City, in Pontiac, Michigan, Alexandria, Virginia. And those three guys, those three doctors, started what we now know as emergency medicine. Uh, and you definitely fill the need. Before that, the ERED, whatever you want to call it, was a wasteland. And uh, so that was uh, a significant event. And then you got accepted as a specialty. You had teaching programs. And pretty soon you had some of the best students from the medical schools going into your specialty. You had achieved, uh, I think, a significant role in medicine, not just emergency medicine. Uh, I once wrote an editorial in one of the throwaways <clears throat> about corporate emergency medicine. And it wasn't all complimentary. Uh, and I think that what AMR did in pre-hospital care, what corporate medicine did in emergency department <coughs> care, uh, some of it was good, not all of it was good. Uh, I think the standards, by and large, are well established, and the guidelines and the principles I think you guys protect. So I think it's on an even keel now. You asked me a, an interesting question down the road. All right, down the road. We have $16 trillion of debt. We have doubled the national debt in the last six or eight years. Okay. We're headed to $20 trillion. I think we'll get yes, it. Agree. Okay. Unfortunately, not many people really understand how devastating that is. Okay. What it means to me, an 89-year-old, is the dollar isn't going to be worth near as much. So, what you've seen uh, in terms of devaluation of your savings account is nothing. Because, fortunately for the United States, Europe and the rest of the world is in nearly as bad a shape as we are. So, we haven't seen the devaluation yet. But we will eventually. Uh, there are some practices in medicine that could be improved. Uh, the cost of medicine is out of sight. Uh, how much is the hospital's fault? How much is the practitioner's fault? I don't know. But it's both of us. And in the emergency medicine field, which both of you are involved in, and I used to be, uh, there are some practices that could be trimmed. Uh, dual response with a high-priced fire engine makes no sense at all, uh, except it allows fire chiefs to buy additional equipment and have bigger budgets. And I think that'll change. And whether, since every, 
just about every major American city, EMS is dominated by the fire department. There are some cities with independent EMS, AMR, right. mainly. But there's an experiment down in Louisiana, Acadian, that is similar to the Florida grocery store Publix. And that is Publix is employee owned and operated. And Acadian Ambulance now has 4,000 uh, employees. And Acadian Ambulance is 85% employee owned. And they used to have seven helicopters and two fixed wing. It's got to be more than that now. Uh, when the oil pipeline from Alaska was built, uh, they wanted EMS on the pipeline for two years. Acadian built, Acadian, uh, what do you call it, bid on it. Right. and got it. Supply. And they supplied EMS on the Alaskan pipeline. They bid and got the contracts for what is called advanced paramedic aboard a platform on the Gulf. And the platforms, the biggest platforms, may employ 700 people. They're there for two weeks and off for two weeks. The paramedics, the advanced paramedics, can take x-rays, prescribe drugs, simple drugs, uh, do sick call, and they eliminated 70% of the transfers from the platform 30, 40, 50 miles back to a tertiary care hospital. And they are connected constantly uh, by uh, TV, and uh, they have their own simple lab, and they can talk to a tertiary care physician anytime they want to on those platforms. So Acadian is, Acadian, uh, I took their medical director to Israel with me once, Ross Judis, nice guy. Uh, and Ross, had been on, they took over New Orleans a few years ago. It was the last part of Louisiana that they took over. There were 14 EMS, separate EMS suppliers in New Orleans and the suburbs. And Katrina. And they had 10,000 victims of various kinds in the Superdome. And Ross Judis had been working. <laughs> and the, the seven helicopters had been working day and night for three days. And here came uh, Governor Blanco, Mayor Nagans, and a bunch of FEMA and <laughs> officials walking on the outside of the Superdome. And uh, Ross said, Mr. Nagins, can I talk to you? <laughs> and he said, I don't have any effing time for that. And Ross said, well, then F you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, for Ross Judice, a quiet, church-going yeah. <laughs> individual, but he was at he was right here. <laughs> That's all he needed. Of course, okay. of course. Anyway, uh, he's the one who told me that story. But anyway, uh, they they had to triage those thousands, and they shipped in the seven helicopters and as many medics, paramedics as they could, and they went through that Superdome.
and uh, it was a hell of a story. We actually sent over a lot of volunteer DMATs and, and units, and uh, at one point we had to pull them back because people were shooting at them. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, we have a... Oh, man. Thank you. Aren't you nice? Thank you. Anything else since we're, we're, we're filming this for history that you want the world to know? Because you are, you have the perspective from the beginning, thoughts, ideas. Is there something really important for you to tell future generations? Because once we put this on digital, it's permanent. Yeah. You'll be able to talk to future generations about here. See? Well, see what I, you did is act of a hero. Okay. You stepped outside the system. You did things that challenged you and that could have got you in trouble, but you did it anyway. Personally, uh, I did not worry, as I remember and look back, I did not worry about my own skin. Part of the reason is in 63, 64, malpractice didn't hang very heavy over my head. It was not. I don't even, I was protected by the hospital. I worked for a county entity and a university. But it really, it never entered the equation at all. It didn't enter my, my mind in no. the early 70s either. No. You know, when I wrote the protocols for my, for Metro Dade, I mean, you just don't think about it. It's the well, thing to do. Yeah. It was, it was a non-factor. Uh, the fire chief worried about the image of his department, and rightly so. Uh, and I respected that. I, I didn't make light of it. Uh, he had a first-rate fire department. He had spent his entire life building it uh, from a junior officer up. Uh, Well, in those, early, in those early days in the seventies, a lot of a lot of fire departments didn't really want to do this. There were a handful around the country that did it, the ones you were talking about. But it became a sales job from from county to county and city to city to get them engaged in this idea. Didn't it? There, yeah, That's there's what I saw. there's an organization, IFC, International Association fire of Fire Chiefs. Right. The IFC, I attended the meetings with Larry Kenny, the national meeting, four, four straight years. And the last year in Seattle, Larry Kenny was nominated to be president of the organization. Great. And I worked for his, uh, at the meeting, I worked for him to be nominated. But <clears throat> the the fire chiefs in the international organization, many of them were not that interested in EMS. They were interested in the fire service, rightly so. That was their job. But EMS, to them, at that time, was a distraction. Of course. And it was foreign to their training. Exactly. Yeah. They were older guys. Yep. Yeah. And uh, wasn't what they wanted to do. Yep. Uh, it was like they had a box of life. There was a little box that this is what firefighters do. And this was a whole new avenue opening up. Nothing new goes easily. Yeah. Nothing new goes easily. Yep. Uh, and of our fire chiefs in Miami, uh, I've often, I, when they, they're all gone except one district chief. Uh, but I once asked one of them in those early days, he said, yeah, we had a couple of fire chiefs that didn't think we ought to be doing this. And uh, I have to respect their, that decision. 
another piece of history that maybe I'm wrong about, but it was important to me, is that I, I think that the five guys that you initially trained, the three or five guys, they all went on to be leaders. They were leaders. Mike Crowley and Len Cobb are still around. Jim Warren and Bill Grace are gone. Uh, Mark Vazu up in Grand Rapids is gone. <coughs> so there's two out of the five. They, still around. But they helped seed the country. Didn't these right. three and five people go to other cities and carry on the message? They seeded the country to help start this whole thing. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of visitors in Miami in the early days. Fire chiefs from uh, Dallas and, and uh, uh, Denver, I think. Houston, Denver, Houston and Denver and you name it around the